Welcome to episode number 43 of Beyond Social Media. Uh, I am David Erickson, your co-host. You can find me on Twitter at DErickson and uh, on my blog at uh, e-strategyblog.com. I'm with, of course, my uh, co-host, B.L. Ackman. B.L. you can find at maximum-plus.com for all things uh, Google+. Plus. Uh, you can find her on Twitter at What's Next and uh, her blog at whatsnextblog.com. Uh, we uh, do every week the worst cases uh, in online communications, the best cases in online communications. We talk about some shiny new stuff that's come along, and we wrap it up with some stats that you want to know. Uh, and, of course, we start every week with the worst cases of the week, and BL, you have the honors. What was the worst case of the week? Well, this is a uniquely horrible worst case. It's a social media song called Let's Get Social, and it's sung by Mary McCoy from Continuum Partners, and she sings this song about this year's social media marketing world. Um, sample lyrics, it's five minutes long. It's a monstrosity. I have to admit I couldn't get through the whole thing, but um, she sings things that like I'm showing you things you like, trying to get engagement. Here's some photos of my life, my cat, my kids, some bacon. And then here's the real WTF moment. She sings socials about the people. Remember, they are people. Do you really need another fan like or share? Do we need another post to show up everywhere? I hope as we scatter we never forget that our posts are live forever, even when we go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and this goes on for five minutes and many verses. We'll post the link if you're so inclined to watch it. Oh my god. I think I got through almost all of it, so I probably got far, further than you did. I have a list of uh of the top <laughs> worst lyricists uh in in, in rock. <laughs> Kiss the band is among the top. Oh um, yes, I would agree with that. Hagar. <laughs> three rock, three lock box. That is one of the worst, one of the worst lyrics ever. Um, <laughs> this might be at the top of the list. Uh, it's at the top of my current list. I don't really have anything quite this horrible anywhere in my collection of anything. So <laughs> I don't know if, if, I, if, I, if I was asked to sing this, I think I would refuse, even if they offered to pay me, because you know. I've got my dignity. <laughs> well, maybe she doesn't have hers anymore. I mean, she stood up there on a stage, and, and then there was the guy who did the uh, the background where he would just go social, social, social. <laughs> social. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is, is that I mean, can you write and I'll communicate. Let's not just rip on the song, which is easy enough to do. Um, <laughs> But you, in all communications, you need to consider your audience, right? So these are people who have paid to go and <laughs> traveled to a social media conference, right? So you assume that they have a certain level of knowledge, right? They're not, <laughs> clueless, they're not completely <laughs> clueless about how social media works. So, I mean... I'm embarrassed for the song. I'm embarrassed for the lyrics. I'm embarrassed for the woman who sang it. I'm embarrassed for the audience who had to sit through it. And then halfway through the through the song, the guy who was doing social, the guy who introduced her and introduced the song, and by the way, he co-wrote the song. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's lifting his hands and clapping his hands together throughout the whole song. And nobody, just, moved. nobody moved. Nobody, not one person. Halfway through the song, he asks everybody to take out their cameras and take a selfie of the person next to him. How awkward can you get? You're I sitting know. in this silly song. It's and so uh, pathetic. <laughs> anyway, that was the worst thing I found in a very long time. I mean, what would really be worse than that? So that's my only bad thing. So you can go on and tell us what you found. <laughs> All right. Going from uh, the ridiculous to... Uh, very serious. Very. Uh, yeah, the heartbeat, heartbleed bug, was the biggest news of the week. Um, this has to do with uh, encryption and technology called Open SSL. SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer, and you see that in transactions when your HTTP colon slash slash changes to HTTPS for secure, secure right? Yeah. Um, so any transaction that you do uses the SSL uh, protocol to encrypt the data that is going through that transaction, right? 
Um, this open source encryption technology is installed on most web servers. So open source web servers that use SSL account for 66% of the sites on the web. Uh, Apache is a, is a uh, web server software that a lot of people use. And uh, so it's a huge deal. And uh, I don't understand all of the technicalities of it, but essentially the, the security flaw in, in OpenSSL is that it allows access to the computer's RAM that is hosting the, 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 the server. And so um, whatever's in that memory is, ac is accessible, and that's the flaw. So it depends on, it, you're sort of helpless, because it depends on people to update their patches for SSL, and you hope that nothing, you know, got stolen in the period. Apparently this has lasted, this flaw has been around for two years. Um, That's so what I don't understand, is that it's been around for two years. Why did it suddenly become a problem? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know the answer to that, but typically, you know, people who, who look out for this stuff and, and, and uh, track security flaws don't talk about it until they have a solution to it, right? Because they don't want to let everybody, all the hackers in the world know about the security flaw. Uh, so that might have been part of it, but... Um, but so everybody's updating their patches. Um, you can sort of try and protect yourself by ensuring that your browser's security settings are che are checking for valid uh, SSL certificates. And so there is a, a lookup function in your browser that will go and go out and see whether uh, the SSL certificate for a given domain is valid. And, and then, also, you should you should do two-step verification any time that you have the opportunity to do it. Because this involves Gmail, this inv this involves like really major sites that we all use. Yeah, and then of course changing your usernames and passwords, which is a pain in the ass. And everybody's you know you you have a zillion new usernames and passwords, but this also highlights the fact that this whole concept of username and passwords is broken, right? <laughs> it, it's impossible to create for normal people to create. Strong encrypt, strong usernames and passwords that uh, that won't get hacked. So I don't know. Somebody's got to come up with that. What it man. also said in some of the articles was that until the security was updated on these sites, your password, if you changed it, was equally vulnerable. So you had to wait for them to make the first move before you would even do that. And you don't need to know whether they made the first move, right? right? So change exactly. your password, username, and password now, and then change it again later, right? Yeah, really. Thanks for that. Yeah, well, this is, you know, the Internet is a utility, and, and as such, it can't break like this. So, you know, it's really frightening that, that this is happening right now because, obviously, we're not secure. Right. So, um, anyway, do what you can and hope for the best, I think, is the, is the answer, right? Um, <laughs> um, on a lighter note, <laughs> on, a, on a more humorous note, maybe I should have led with this one, um, Rolling Stone magazine does new cover features Julia uh, Louis Dreyfus, who is um, uh, was of course in Seinfeld and is now uh, the star of HBO's uh, comedy series Veep. Uh, she is the vice president in that comedy series, and they have uh, Rolling Stone features her on the cover of their newest um, magazine, and she uh, she is supporting she is sporting sporting a bear tattooed with the Constitution of the United States. So on her back, uh, there is the Constitution of the United States ta tattooed on it, uh, with John Hancock's famous signature displayed prominently below the Constitution, right? The only problem, John Hancock didn't sign the Constitution. He, of course, uh, his famous signature graces the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't this you, just happen, Dave? Didn't this just happen with something else? Where something yeah, there was a historical... Go, another, his, wasn't there yeah. another instance of this just a couple weeks ago, and didn't we talk about it here? I have to look that up. Yeah. I think uh, it's not the first time it happened. You know, Americans don't know our history. We just don't. I mean, we yeah, don't know geography, on. and we don't know history. And, you know, stuff like that is really scary. It was Groupon citing, uh, citing uh, Hamilton as a president. That's what it that's was. That's right. That's right. I remember that. You talked about it, and he, he, you know, that's not what happened. So, so uh, 
Julia Julia Dreyfus did uh, respond to that uh, in a tweet, and she acknowledged Hancock signed the Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution. Yet another Mike f up dummy. So she's referring to a character in the HBO show uh, uh, Veep, who is a bumbling White House staffer. <laughs> and so she sort of cutely blamed it on the White House staffer. That got 50, 251 retweets, 344 favorites. So it was a it was a pretty good way of responding to clearly a you know embarrassing screw up. So that really was that that kudos for that. That was a good one. Well, I, are we on to good news? We are. Let's go into good okay. news. I have I have kind of a fun one. Um, Richard Branson, who uh, you know lives quite the life, um, he has uh, Virgin Galactic, and he is searching for the child who inspired him uh, about 25 years ago. Um, in 1988, he went on a BBC TV show called Going Live, and he answered a call from a young uh, girl whose name was uh, Sheehan. Musafer, and she asked him, have you ever thought about going into space? And he said, I'd love to go into space, as I think pretty well everybody who's watching the show would like to go. And he said, when you see those magnificent pictures in space and the incredible views, I can think of nothing nicer. So if you're building a spacecraft, I'd like to come with you. Well, of course, now he's building a spacecraft, and so he's looking for her because he wants to take her on it. And Virgin Galactic has taken deposits from more than 700 people who want to fly into um, suborbital space, and it's a six-passenger, it's called Spaceship Two, and it could actually begin commercial operations before the end of 2014, so he would like to take her with him, and so he did a video and he asked, can you help us find the child who sparked my dream? So I don't know what the status of that is, apparently they haven't found her yet, but um, I hope she gets to go. That's Awesome. That's an awesome story in and of itself. It's going to be an even awesomer story if they find her and she takes, them. She, she, uh, he takes her to, uh, to space. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Isn't that great? What have you got, Dave? Uh, so, Ikea. Ikea, you've heard of uh, pop-up stores, right, in retail? This is a, a common tactic that, uh, that uh, retailers will use to gain some... Uh, Gain some public relations as well as to take advantage of seasonal uh, seasonal selling and stuff. Um, IKEA has a different take on the pop-up store. Uh, they have done a pop-up train, and so what they did is uh, transform a Japanese monorail into basically a comfortable living space. Um, this was to kick off their newest location in Tokyo. Uh, so they jazzed up the monorail with their signature bold colors and patterns. They had benches that were transformed into comfortable couches upholstered with uh, IKEA fabric, uh, had cushy throw pillows on them. Floors were lined with their kitschy printed uh, carpets, uh, lanterns and flags hung from the ceiling and on the window. So it just looks like a living space. And so travelers in, in Tokyo get on the monorail and are see, met with this. And it, it's just a really clever way of drawing attention to your new store and, uh, and gaining a lot of uh, media coverage as well. So. The monorail is operating. You can yep. ride on it. Yep. Yep. Well, that's very cool. Well, you know, in New York City, on the shuttle between Grand Central Station and Times Square, advertisers redo the inside of that train, which is about four cars long and they'll transform it to look like a library or to look like various different things, but not with actual furniture and stuff. They, you know, it's, it's images. That's so cool. Very that cool. really is. Well, uh, uh, speaking of cool, uh, there's a Fabergé egg hunt that's going on all over Manhattan, and it's a multi-channel social media um, event, and it's called the thebigegghunt.org. And uh, I was having breakfast in Central Park at the boathouse, and right outside of the boathouse are two of these fabulous three-foot-high Fabergé eggs, one of them, and they're in, in these um, plexiglass cases, and they're on pedestals, and one of them is a picture of an egg with a rat on top, and the other one is this absolutely beautiful, looks like a real Fabergé egg, and underneath the eggs on the pedestal, there are instructions on how you have to go and download the Big Egg Hunt app to participate in the Big Egg Hunt. And there's a um, QR code that will take you to the app if you're on the street. And so the deal is that, and there's a map that shows you where there are. I think there are 120 of them. And you're supposed to collect them. And they had tried this out in London. Millions of people participated, and it was a big hit. So 
Now it's our turn in New York. And you collect the eggs, and then you enter this sweepstake for a chance to win a Fabergé jewel-encrusted necklace. And the app has a map, and it has a real-time information feed with clues and an egg basket where you put your eggs when you find them. And then you're able also to share um, egg sculptures that you make with either existing photographs or ones that you take. And you can create up to five submissions a day into the contest, which goes on until April 25th. And um, it's interactive, and you can post them on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, on the site. Uh, and it, there is a, um, an opportunity to you know, put your eggs into the gallery that's on the site. And there are interactive eggs by artists including Langdon Graves and Clifford Ross. And it's a really wonderful, fun promotion. And uh, it was so exciting to find these two big, gorgeous things <laughs> just there. They just arrived. So, um, you know, this is a really, this is, I think millions of people will participate in this as well. It's gotten good press. That's very cool. And it's obviously a, a fantastic fit for Fabergé, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, very clever. And, and the website is really fun, and, and you know, it's, it's like a puzzle in, in itself. So go take a look at it, thebigegghunt.org. Cool, cool. So yeah. um, I've got one that uh, my favorite uh, football team, you know, I like to talk about football, Bill. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings uh, have come off a rather dismal season. We've got the eighth pick in the draft as proof of it. Um, so they aren't doing very well on the field, but I always knew that they were doing very well online. They are very smart about what they do online and uh, are very good at content marketing. Um, uh, I always knew that, but now I've got some objective proof. So it turns out that the Vikings are among the top NFL teams, top 10 NFL teams in web traffic. Uh, they produce three TV shows and five radio shows a week. They have their own in-house studio. Um, they have social channels. They're super active. Their website is uh, very popular. It's a go-to source for fans for information about the team. And Content Lee... Uh, has done a case study on them. So by the time, and this is uh, from old data, so they've only increased their activity and become better at it. Uh, but by the time the season ended in January 2010, so this is several years old, the newvikings.com site, after it had been uh, redesigned, had served 35 million page views, including 4.5 million video views. Wow. Course, that is the, the, uh, the format of choice for a lot of people. Uh, increasingly, people are watching more and more video. And that's an, a significant increase that led to 822,000-plus 800, ticket-related clicks that season. So they're tying it to you know revenue sources as well. So um, great job of the Vikings, uh, and uh, I continue to be a fan despite our poor performance on the field. <laughs> Well, I know you're a big football fan. Have you broken any fingers lately? Not <laughs> lately, thankfully, yes. I'm trying to avoid well, it. That's a really extraordinary story. I, you know, there are several sports teams that have done really, really well in social media, and you wonder why other uh, areas uh, don't take, you know, other industries, I guess sports is an industry, why, why they don't take a cue from them, really. One, one another industry that's doing really well with social media is the real estate industry. And uh, there's a broker in New York who got a $13 million deal entirely with social media. The buyer brought the, bought the property sight unseen except for online images. Uh, and it is Douglas Element. And the, uh, the team at Douglas Element got a message on WeChat, which is one of the most popular social networking sites in China that there was an investor who wanted to buy a property in New York and he was interested in purchasing a unit at um, Baccarat Hotels and Residences which is this very luxurious condo on 53rd Street on the west side and he wound up with two of them a ten million dollar three bedroom and a three million dollar one bedroom all without ever coming to New York or ever seeing the building which is still being finished so um, that's a pretty remarkable use of social media. It was all done back and forth online. Wow. That's the first time it's happened. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That's impressive. Now, all real estate agents are going to be checking out WeChat. <laughs> you bet they are. Well, you know, what a lot of people are doing is using Google Hangouts to um, 
have multiple cameras because you can enter a hangout with your phone and your computer and, well, you can't start from your phone. If you start from your computer, you can enter from your phone and another device as well, so you can bring in an iPad and a phone, and that allows you to walk around and actually demonstrate live the property and take questions at the same time from a person who's in a hangout. So that is certainly uh, you know, a, really a real estate trend that's going to grow, and the cool part about it is it's free. Very nice. Virtual open houses. That's, off that's awesome. Exactly, and you can have up to 10 people in them, or you can do it with one person, so that's a pretty cool thing. <laughs> so, cool. Yeah, and um, the, the other, uh, are we on to shiny objects? I think you were. We are. Oh, okay, well, Google's got a shiny object, and uh, they have this crazy modular phone called Aura that you're going to be able to build yourself, and they just released this module development kit, and uh, it's not ready yet, but it's coming, and you'll be able to take individual modules and make your phone mini, small, or large, and the bigger you make it, the more you can see on the screen, and you'll be able to power the device with one or many batteries. Um, you'll be able to swap out a depleted battery for a fresh one, which every phone should be able to do, without powering, powering off your phone. And you'll be able to charge one or more batteries in the phone from one um, charging device. And then they have these replaceable module shells, and um, you can uh, have 3D color printing that will allow you to aesthetically customize your phone any way that you want. Of course, you need a 3D printer for that. But you can do that before purchase, and then you'll be able to replace the modules and the and, and update the shells, and they you can configure it in a whole bunch of different ways. You'll be able to order parts online, probably via Google Play, but you work through the design that you're going to have and the specifications online before you pony up the cash. So uh, that's coming soon. And I think that ought to make a pretty big dent in the iPhone market, just my opinion. <laughs> wow. Welcome to the age of personalization writ large. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. Yeah that's, a pr yeah, that's a pretty remarkable development. I don't know the price because they haven't talked about what the price will be, but I'm yeah. sure it will be competitive. And if you look at you know, what they charged for Chrome, um, maybe this will be very price competitive. I think they'd have to be price competitive to compete with iPhone big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm waiting for iPhone 6, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I got a, 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 a shiny object that uh, I haven't tried yet, but it's so low cost that I'm going to, and it looks awesome. You know how much I love uh, heat maps and, uh, and studies that sort of track how people actually pay attention to stuff. Uh, so I came across this uh, site called Fengui. F-E-N-G hyphen G-U-I dot com. And, of course, the geese, geeks amongst us know that G-U-I stands for Graphical User Interface, right? So what this site does for a very low price, uh, it allows you to upload an image to it, and it will, it's got an algorithm that uh, predicts where people will pay attention to that image, what they will pay attention to on that image. So you've seen heat maps that show the intensity of gaze of people looking at a, an image, uh, you see a heat, you see heat maps that uh, show the uh, eye movements across the screen. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. Eye movements uh, where people are looking at an image. This simulates that activity based on uh, data sets of actual eye tracking and cursor movement studies that have been done in the past. And so it is an algorithm. It's not humans looking at it. It is basing it, but it does it has a comparison of the actual uh, eye tracking studies that they're using compared to what this tool does. And it's fairly uh, accurate if you look at those comparisons. And there are brands such as Wall Street Interactive that are using it. So it's worth, I think, the low cost of trying it out to see, getting a sense of where people are paying attention to your individual images. So I'm going to try that out and, uh, and we'll see how it works. But um, What is the end result? Is it a heat map? Yep, yep, yep. It's a heat oh. map or a uh, curse or a uh, attention uh, scanning study, so it shows where the first eye movement went to, to the second eye movement went to, et cetera, et cetera. Does it so, do it in real time, Dave? How does it work? You upload the image and it spits back the. It, it processes it and it gives you the image back as the the product is the image it returns, which is a heat map or a scanning scanning study. Oh, that's very interesting. I want to play with that too. Yeah. Uh, 
I just wanted to say one thing before we do the daily numbers. On Thursday, uh, April 17th, I am doing a webinar uh, on Google Plus in a hangout with Joan Stewart, the publicity hound. And if you go to whatsnextblog.com, all the details are there. And it is to explain how to use Google community, Google Plus communities in marketing. They are really a very important tool and um, the most supportive group of communities I've ever come across. And um, so I hope you'll join us. That will be Thursday from 4 to 5. Very good, very good. Absolutely. Or again, well, what's next, blog.com, right? Yes. Okay, okay. So, yeah, let's wrap this up. The daily numbers, uh, a fun one this time. Uh, this is what I call the HBO effect, but it can be applied to other things as well, or it has in the past. Uh, so, baby names. Um, HBO has a uh, series, a fantasy series called um, Game of Thrones. Very, very popular. It's been running for several, uh, several uh, seasons now. And uh, Vox Blog has uh, taken a look at Social Security Administration data uh, on baby names from 2010 to 2012. Turns out uh, a particular character, the character of uh, Daenerys Targaryen, who is played by Amelia Clark, um, she's this hot slain king character, uh, daughter of a slain king character who has spent most of the series amassing forces to reclaim the lands that were once her father's. Uh, so she's a very compelling character. And uh, she has earned the name uh, Khaleesi after marrying one of the uh, a Dothraki leaders. So she's named Khaleesi in the, in the um, series. And plus, she has pets who are dragons. So awesome all around, right? Um, from 2000, 2010 to 2012, there were 21 new newborns in 2012 named Daenerys, okay? In uh, 2012, there were 146 babies named Khaleesi. So in 2010, less than five newborns were named Khaleesi. That rose to 28 in 2011, and then more than quin uh, quintupled into 146 in 2012. So... Pop culture's effect on the rest of us, right? People are naming babies after their favorite characters. Um, this is not unique. So uh, Harry Potter uh, from 1996 to 2012, Harry Potter names. People are being named after uh, after Harry Potter names. Draco, Hermione, Sirius, those names were becoming popular as baby names as well. But uh, And back in the day, back when I was a kid, Farrah Fawcett, that people are starting to name their, their kids Farrah after Farrah Fawcett, the... the uh, Pinup Girl and, and Charlie's Angel uh, uh, actress. So uh, there you have it, the daily numbers. I think that goes back a long, long way. Uh, you know, there were Davies for Davy Crockett, and, and what was the kid's name on Lassie? T uh, Timmy. Uh, uh -huh. A lot of Timothys that came from that. I mean, this is just something that, you know, culture has, popular culture has affected names forever. But I still think uh, Jacob is the top male name, and I don't know what the top female name is. But I do remember that in my first grade class, there were at least five girls named Barbara. And and the teacher said, you're going to be Barbara, you're going to be Bobby, you're going to be Babs, you're going to be Bambi to one of them. Oh, my Dude. God, that's not yeah. nice. They yeah, should, that's not nice. That's not nice. be renaming people. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that does bring us to the end of episode 43 of the Beyond Social Media Show. And we will have the video timestamped on the Beyond Social Media Show blog and on our Google Plus page. And um, unfortunately, I kind of screwed up the event when I set it up, so it won't be on the event page, but it will be in these other places. And we'll share that. And so you can find David at D. Erickson on Twitter at eStrategyBlog.com, of course on Google Plus, and eStrategyTV.com. Then you can find me, I'm at, at What's Next on Twitter. I'm at Maximum-Plus.com. Maximum uh, Plus is a um, company that teaches all things Google and sets up Google events, Google Plus events. And um, you'll find me at whatsnextblog.com, where I've been hanging out since 2002. And um, you will occasionally find me writing for Ad Age Digital Next, 
we thank you for joining us on Beyond Social Media Show. We will uh, see you next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks.